Kansas 3rd District Congressional Debate. Incumbent Congressman Democrat Dennis Moore squares off against Republican Chris Kobach. Here's your moderator, Nick Haynes. Hello, good evening, and welcome. We're at the Polsky Theater here at Johnson County Community College, the backdrop for this Kansas 3rd District Congressional Debate. Tonight we ask, how much do you really know about Dennis Moore and Chris Kobach? You've no doubt seen their campaign ads, but this hour you get a rare chance to see these candidates side by side as they debate the issues and their vision for the future. Uh, by the way, later in the program you'll get a chance to uh, see them truth check each other's political commercials and they'll respond to the questions of citizens who submitted questions to our debate sponsoring organizations, the Kansas City Star, the League of Women Voters of Johnson County, KCPT Public Television, and Johnson County Community College. And now to our candidates. For the last six years, this man has been the face of the Kansas 3rd Congressional District in Washington. Lenexa Democrat Dennis Moore is an attorney by profession and for more than a decade served as the Johnson County District Attorney. The Republican candidate is Chris Kobach, a constitutional law professor at UMKC. He recently served in the U.S. Justice Department as a special counsel to Attorney General John Ashcroft. He's a former member of the Overland Park uh, City Council. Gentlemen, both of you have talked about values during this election campaign, that you are the candidate who really represents the values of this Kansas 3rd District. But what does that really mean? In 90 seconds or less, Professor Kobach, tell us three values you believe are important to the people of this district and why you, more than your opponent, represent them best. First, let me begin by thanking my wife, Heather, for uh, being here tonight and standing with, standing with me in this campaign. Uh, I would say that there are three values easily that can be named. First of them is that Kansans value national security. And during my years as counsel to Attorney General Ashcroft, I worked steadily to implement programs that are making us safer in the United States now. FBI background checks on high-risk visitors, fingerprinting at the border, deportation of criminal aliens, and several other programs. But I saw many other gaps in our laws that are not being addressed, and we need congressmen who are willing to address those gaps and have the knowledge to do so. Uh, I'm also willing to say that Congressman Moore has failed in this regard. He has taken votes that do, no uphold, do not uphold our values in national security. Uh, specifically, he voted twice to weaken the Patriot Act. I think we need to recognize that we must give the law enforcement uh, people the tools they need to fight terrorism. And we must also value our family security above the political agenda of the ACLU. Uh, the second value I would mention is keeping our tax dollars here at home. I would vote consistently for tax cuts in Congress. In contrast, my opponent, Mr. Moore, voted against the most critical tax cuts of recent years, specifically the 2003 tax cuts that included the child tax credit of $1,000. And then the third set of values I would talk about are the moral values. I think Dennis Moore has shown himself to be utterly out of touch with those values as well, the things that defined us as Kansans. And I would say that there are two votes in particular that make this clear. First, this September, he voted against the federal marriage amendment. If marriage comes to mean not anything, then marriage will mean nothing. We must protect marriage in the Constitution. And second, in September of 2001, he voted against the Boy Scouts, forcing them to accept okay. homosexual your, scout Your matches. time is up. You'll have a chance in a rebuttal. But 90 seconds, Congressman Moore. Maybe we found something we agree on, and that's national security. And I don't know one single member of Congress who doesn't believe in enforcing and protecting our national security. And I even give that to my opponent, Mr. Kobach. I worked, and in fact, I'm on a member of the Congressional 9-11 Commission Caucus that uh, was intended to protect our national security. And I watched with interest as the 9-11 Commission handed down their report on July 22 of this year. It was a unanimous report unanimous recommendations for enactment of security provisions that would protect our country and our people by five Democrats and five Republicans. And almost nothing ever happens unanimously in Congress. And it happened this time. I was glad to see that. In fact, I worked on a bipartisan basis with a Republican and Democrat, Chris Shays and Carolyn Maloney. And the senators were Lieberman and Collins to try to get that enacted. President Bush asked for that enactment. And instead, the Republican leadership in Congress decided they'd do their own thing. The president has expressed some concerns and reservations about some of that. Education is the value of uh, members uh, of people in Kansas. Uh, obviously, health, affordable health care is the value of people in Congress. And when Mr. Kobach says I voted against tax cuts, in fact, I voted for the child tax credit elimination or extension recently, 
and uh, elimination of the alternative minimum tax. He knows that, and he's telling half of the truth. On each of these questions, you're going to get 30 seconds to rebut, and your 30 seconds of rebuttal time starts now, Professor Kobach. It's easy to talk national security, but you've got to look at specific votes. Uh, in May of 2002, Mr. Moore voted to block the funding of ballistic missile defense. You know, in the war on terrorism, we've got to do more than revisit 9-11. We must plan for the next attack. Iran has already announced that their Shahib-3 missile is ready for deployment, and they are seeking a nuclear warhead. We need to plan ahead and deploy systems that will protect us, and I think Mr. Moore has not shown the foresight to do that. As far as extending the child tax credit, yes, he did vote that. to come. First, he voted against giving it in the first place in 2003. Then, when it came to the floor recently, he said, no, he wants an alternative that would raise another tax in order to give the tax an extension. Okay, he your, doesn't want to cut your taxes Your time is overall. up. Dennis Moore. Hey, an expert on national security said, we don't have to worry quite as much, not even close as much, to a delivery of a missile with a warhead to our country as somebody with a suitcase bomb or a backpack bomb coming in. He wants to spend more than $100 billion dollars and right now, we've got a $7.4 trillion national debt. We're over five, $422 billion in deficit this year. We don't have the money for that system. And more importantly, it's not even necessary right now. So when you listen to him, he talks about being a fiscal conservative, but just not the case. OK, let's move on to fresh territory. You've been talking about some events uh, beyond our borders. Let's talk a little bit about foreign policy. The United States is preparing a new Iraqi government and is moving on plans to withdraw American troops. Would you proceed, Congressman Moore, with the same plans as President Bush? I heard five, four classified and one unclassified briefing before the President presented his use of force resolution to Congress. I voted in favor of that use of force resolution based upon the information I had, and I was absolutely convinced there were weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. I voted for the $87 billion to fund our troops. Once they were there, I wasn't about to leave them without the, with the equipment and all they needed. Uh, I don't have a problem so much with what we did. I'm glad Saddam Hussein's gone. I just wish the president had gathered a greater coalition of nations before we went in to Iraq. And I think uh, Secretary Powell advised him to do that. I wish he had listened to the advice of Secretary Powell, because right now it appears to be the Americans against the Iraqis, when in fact it should be the whole world against Saddam Hussein. I'm glad Saddam Hussein's gone. And I, once we've taken a government out, I think we have an absolute responsibility to stay with them, to work with them, to try to get them in a position where they can establish a government that will function for them and work for the people of Iraq. If we do anything else, when I was there in early January of this year, I talked to some Iraqi people, some women and men, and they told me that if they're glad Saddam Hussein's gone, they don't want us to overstay our welcome. But if we pull out too soon, if we pull out too soon, there'll be an absolute bloodbath there. What they're talking about is the disparate uh, religious sects in Iraq. So I think we have some responsibility to gather a greater coalition and go in there and try and try to uh, make a functioning government for the people in Iraq, help them set up their own government. Professor Kobach. Let me be unequivocally clear. We must stay the course, and we were right to invade Iraq when we did. Not because of weapons of mass destruction, but because Saddam Hussein was a haven for and a sponsor of terrorism around the world. He was offering $25,000 to the family of any suicide bomber that detonated himself in Israel. And now Iraq serves to push the battle, the front, in the war against terrorism outward. Uh, a buddy of mine just refer returned from Iraq four weeks ago, and he reports that we have killed or captured thousands of terrorists who are not from Iraq, from other countries, Saudi Arabia, Yemen, and many others. Those terrorists would be coming to America to wage their jihad if we were not presenting a forward front in the battle in Iraq. I'd rather see them face our soldiers in Iraq than our families here in America. There's also been many successes in Iraq that go underreported. For example, over 400,000 kids have up-to-date immunizations, 4.5 million people have clean drinking water for the first time, and more than 1 million satellite dishes are on Iraqi homes. And let me tell you, that's more important than it might seem, because free information is the lifeblood of democracy. Now, my opponent, on the other hand, does only the bare minimum to support our, our national defenses. He'll vote to give soldiers plane tickets home. He'll vote to give them the minimum authorization, but he won't go beyond that. He won't give them new weapon systems they needed. For example, he voted against the bunker buster weapon system in 2002 and in 2003. He also voted against increasing funding of appropriations to the Department of Defense and the Department of Homeland Security for the war against terrorism in 2003. We've got to do more than platitudes and the, the bare basics. We have got to give our soldiers the best equipment in the world so that they can win and be safe in Iraq. Congressman Moore, 30 seconds to rebut. Every time there's been a request for supporting our troops, I have done it. In fact, when I heard our troops were coming back after six months in country, for two weeks R&R &R in this country, visiting with their families, I heard and I learned 
that they were required to pay their own domestic travel. I filed a bill, it's now law, that pays domestic travel for those troops. I also found out there's a death gratuity benefit of only $12,000, which to me is like a slap in the face to a family who's lost somebody in Iraq. I filed a bill that would increase it to $50,000. We have 205 co-sponsors, Republicans and Democrats. I work across party lines, and we'll make that the law. Professor Kobach, the last word on this question goes to you. Well, it's critical that we get the truth out here. Uh, the bill that would give soldiers the plane tickets home, yes, that did pass. It passed unanimously by voice vote, but he did not file it. If you go to the uh, records on the Internet, you'll see that the sponsor of the bill is Mr. Ranstead from Mr. Minnesota. It is not Mr. Moore of Kansas. Anyone can jump on and be a co-sponsor to these wild, wildly popular things, but the point is you ha he was not the one who filed the bill. Uh, furthermore, the talk about the plane tickets coming home, yeah, that's a good thing, and everybody voted for it. But you know what doesn't get to the real problem? The real problem is that more than one-third of the soldiers there have to take their leave in Iraq because there aren't planes to bring them to the United States. Okay, we're going to move back now to home, and one of the perennial issues that comes up every campaign in this district is the issue of education. While there are many ways to improve a child's ability to learn, Chris Kobach, study after study has shown that one of the most effective ways of boosting performance is lowering classroom sizes. Is there anything you could or would do in Congress that would address that issue? Lowering classroom sizes is absolutely something that has proven to be effective. Uh, however, we must remember that the primary responsibility for funding and for regulating education remains at the state level. So to make a, a, an empty huge promise that I would cut funding by, uh, or cut classroom size by some, uh, s some specified amount would be wrong because Congress is unlikely to massively increase funding right after the No Child Left Behind Act increased funding to education uh, by 49%. Now, there's something else that we must do also, and that is we must take away the strings attached to these federal grants. Now, there's the problem right now of unfunded federal mandates, and many people have persuasively made the case that the No Child Act is an unfunded federal mandate. Now, we have completely different approaches to that problem. My opponent consistently says, well, we'll just fully fund the federal mandates. Well, he's been offering you that answer for six years now, and it just never happens. My answer is to eliminate the federal mandate. Keep the federal fund in place, but let the people here who know the kids' names decide how to spend that money. He had an opportunity to vote for a bill in Congress a few years ago that would have reduced the strings attached, in order to, to phrase it differently, it would have increased the amount of federal funds that are no strings attached from 50% to 75%, giving our teachers and school districts the freedom and the flexibility they need. He voted against it. He has shown that his preference is for bureaucratic control from Washington. That is what must end if we are really to make our schools better. Congressman Moore. When Mr. Kobach says to keep the federal mandate, uh, kept, keep the federal funds but eliminate the federal mandates, he really does not have a clue about how Washington works. It doesn't work that way at all. In fact, I promise you, Congress will never provide funds to the, this state or around the, any of the states without some strings attached and some oversight by Congress. So you need to understand that first, Mr. Kobach. I have been a consistent critic of IDEA, which was passed back in 1975, Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. Congress at that time said to state, states and local school boards, you take special needs, special education children out of hospitals and institutions, bring them to public schools for education, and we will pay 40% of the cost of educating those children. Well, the states and locals did, and Congress didn't. 29 years later, they're up to 19% of the 40% they promised, the highest they've ever funded. Billions of dollars of shortchanging. I believe strongly in local control of education, but when Congress makes a promise, they ought to keep it. They ought to keep it. And then comes along No Child Left Behind. The President asks for accountability and responsibility by the education system. I talked to the teachers and the superintendents, and they said, yes, we'll do it. We need the money. They did. Congress passed it. And now Congress has shortchanged education again, $9, million, $9 billion. When they make a promise, they ought to keep it. Our kids are worth it. And for Mr. Kobach to say that we can get, we can have the, uh, the mandate or the, the money without the mandate is simply not reality. He doesn't understand the way Congress works. And I wish it were different. I truly do. But that's not the way it works. You have a chance to respond, uh, Professor Kobach. No, it's not that I don't understand the way Congress works. I don't understand the way Mr. Moore works. You see, Mr. Moore had the opportunity for a bill, to vote for a bill that would have freed up those strings, that would have allowed school districts flexibility to use federal money where they wanted. That vote was on May 23, 2001, vote 137. Yet he opposed it. 
So there are people in Congress who are thinking differently. And frankly, we need more people in Congress who think differently and take education reform seriously. Mr. Moore has not been willing to move that way. Instead, he keeps offering you the same empty promise. Oh, we'll fully fund IDEA. It hasn't happened yet, and he's not going to make it happen. Congressman Moore. Uh, it can happen if we work together, Republicans and Democrats come together. My opponent takes pride in saying, I don't go along to get along. Well, I'll tell you, that's exactly the attitude that won't work in Congress, because if you don't try to reach out to other people and work with other people, you never have a chance to get anything passed. This party right now is controlled. We can work together if we try, but we need to reach across party lines to do that, and I've shown, a, I've shown an ability and a willingness to do that. When the President's right, I say, Mr. President, I'm going to support you, even though it makes some of my Democratic friends unhappy. When the President's wrong, I say, Mr. President, there's a better way. Okay. In the recent presidential debate in St. Louis, both candidates were asked by a citizen participant to look squarely into the camera's lens and solemnly pledge not to propose or support any legislation in the next four years that will increase the tax burden on families earning less than $200,000 a year. Congressman Moore, are you prepared to look into the camera and make that same pledge this hour? You know, if we're going to be reality, based here, I don't know that one of us can make that pledge. And I've, I've, I've been listening to Mr. Kobach, and frankly, he's never seen a, any tax he doesn't want to cut. And that's all fine and well, except right now we have a $7.4 trillion national debt. We have a deficit of $422 billion last year. We have what I call the debt tax. The interest on our national debt is almost a billion dollars a day. And I'm concerned about my children and my grandchildren and your children and your grandchildren and he should be concerned about his daughter because in the future what's going to happen what's going to happen is when the baby boom start to retire in about five years the next generation my kids are going to have to pay for the retirement of the baby boomers that's the way it's always worked under social security and by the same token by the same token if they have to take on by that time a 10 trillion plus dollar debt and who knows how much deficit and if interest rates go up uh, a debt tax of a billion and a half or two billion dollars a day. How can they survive? I'm concerned about this. I talked to a Republican, a conservative Republican friend of mine in Congress, and I said, we have to start talking about this. And he said, Dennis, after the election, when things calm down, we're going to start saying the same thing you are because it has to happen. And when you take tax cuts and tax cuts and tax cuts, what he's doing is charging the national, national credit card and passing the bill along to his kids and grandkids. That is absolutely unfair, and I hope it stops. And I think there are good people on both sides in Congress who want to make it stop. Chris Kobach. I take it the answer to his, the question was no, that he's not willing to make that statement. I am willing to make that statement. I will not raise taxes, and I will not raise taxes on any sector of the American public. I've taken the No New Taxes pledge. He has not. That's one of the many reasons, in addition to his votes, that the National Taxpayer Union has given Congressman Moore an F grade for his unwillingness to protect the American taxpayer. Now, I've told you about the May of 2003 vote, where he voted against the tax package not, one, not once but twice, the original $550 billion package, as well as the $350 billion package that was finally passed. Um, you know, apparently Mr. Moore thinks that uh, okay, Uncle Sam wait, needs that uh, money. I'm sorry, your time is up there. It... Okay, we got it. I'm sorry. Okay, yes. You're so going to much... be allowed, you, you're going to be given uh, another 60 seconds here. I'm sorry. So you continue with your train of thought and we'll pick okay. it up once you've finished. Let me get back on the Have contract. you got your train of thought back? Okay, yeah. Okay, um, you have another 60 seconds. That child tax credit that was part of that tax package was critical to making ends meet for young families. We have a baby daughter now, and I know how expensive those diapers are and that baby food is. We need that kind of tax relief. Dennis Moore voted against it. He also votes against eliminating the death tax. Anyone out here associated with a small business or a family farm knows that death taxes cripple those farms and cripple those businesses at the time of generational transfer. And he's been a vocal opponent of eliminating the death tax. Now, what about the budget deficit? Well, first of all, if the budget deficit is the only reason, and that's the primary reason he wouldn't vote for a tax cut, then why did he vote to extend the tax this past summer during a time of higher deficits? Doesn't quite make sense, does it? But secondly, if he were truly concerned about deficits, he'd look at how we balanced the budget in the, 1990, in the 1990s. We balanced the budget by holding the growth of federal government steadily while stimulating the economy through tax cuts. That's the recipe for balancing the budget now. We have to do that. He's unwilling to vote for the Spending Control Act, which would hold the growth steady. Thank you. And now 30 seconds of rebuttal time to each of you, beginning with you, Congressman Moore. When you listen to him, listen carefully, because he says something as absolute fact and it's half-truth, and sometimes a half-truth is worse than a lie. When he tells you, I voted against 
the, the child tax credit. I voted against the AMT reform. I voted against elimination of marriage tax penalty. Last year, as part of a, a huge tax package, when we were in deficit mode, at that time we had a tremendous deficit, more than $450 billion. I did vote against that package, but I voted against each of the taxes I just named in the last two months. And that's, those are middle class tax relief. Um, on the taxes, no, I'm not, I'm not obscuring the record at all. He did vote to extend the child tax credit just a, uh, two months ago. But before he did so, he voted for a Democratic alternative that would have increased taxes elsewhere in order to offset so there would be no net tax cut. He's never willing just to cut taxes straight away. Now, you know, there, here's a statement from the Lawrence Journal World, and I think it sums it up. Moore is a master of saying what voters in the third district want to hear, but his voting record in Washington does not necessarily parallel what he tells the folks back home. Perfect example. He runs for cover when he sees that it's going to pass, but he tries to get a substitute in that would not cut taxes at all. To you, Chris Kobach. Would you allow Americans to take part of the social security taxes they pay now and invest that money in private savings accounts that they couldn't touch until they retire? And if not, what do you propose to do to ensure that social security will be available when today's 20 and 30 year olds retire? 90 seconds. Uh, yes, I would be willing to allow a portion uh, of social security funds to be invested in personal retirement accounts at the option of the person uh, investing that money. That would only be a portion, it would be less than half. That is not a risky scheme, as some Democrats like to claim. We have to recognize that Social Security will begin running a deficit in the year 2018. If you poll 18 to 24 year olds and ask them how likely they think Social Security is to exist by the time they retire, they say they are more likely to believe in the existence of, of UFOs than in the existence of Social Security by the time they retire. We have to do something about it because the system is going to go broke. Now, I am against cutting Social Security benefits, and frankly, there's no way that that's going to pass in Washington. I am against cutting benefits. I'm also against increasing Social Security taxes. If you're unwilling to do those two things, you have got to find some way to make a, their, to make a greater return on the investment. Now, right now, the average person retiring uh, sees their dollars invested yielding only a 2% uh, rate of return over the course of their lives. 2%. That's pathetic. And then to add insult to injury, we tax Social Security benefits. Dennis Moore had the opportunity to vote against the taxation of Social Security benefits, and he voted for a package that would have continued taxing Social Security benefits. We have to get a higher rate of return than 2% to make the system balance. The way to do that is to allow some portions to be invested in private equities. If you just had a, a way of investing where half of it would be in government bonds and then half of it would be in low-risk index funds, you could get 5% return easily, and we could make the system solvent. We've got to think differently. We've got to reform the system. We can't stick our head in the sand and s simply pretend that nothing's going to happen. Congressman Moore. The first bill I filed in Congress as a new member of Congress back in 1991 is one that would take Social Security off budget. What that means, it would, it would actually create a Social Security trust fund and not commingle re regular tax revenues with Social Security. What he wants to do is more tax cuts, more tax cuts, and guess where the money comes for tax cuts? From Social Security funds, which should be placed in a trust fund and segregated and separate apart. And yet, what he wants to do is use that for more tax cuts. In fact, my opponent has spoken out in favor of cuts in Medicare, cut Medicare benefits. He's talked about uh, freezing COLAs, cost of living adjustments on Social Security. He's advocating private Social Security, and he, he's true. It's not total privatization, but partial privatization. What he doesn't tell you, and what other people who believe in what he does doesn't tell you, is that it would cost over $2 trillion to, to transition to that system. Because right now, the people who are paying the Social Security dollars in are paying for the next generation ahead of them. And if you take that money out, it's going to cost $2 trillion to transition. He never says where that money's going to come from because he doesn't have an answer. What I did was about three years ago file a bill that would allow people to establish private accounts outside of Social Security for IRAs and raise the contribution from $2,000 to $5,000. It's now law. We can do that. That will take the pressure off the Social Security system, and that will do well for the people in this country. Your chance to respond, Professor Kobach. Uh, Mr. Moore, you have completely flip-flopped since 1999 and 1998. When you expressed support for privatization in Social Security, I'll quote E. Thomas McClanahan, Kansas City Star, November 99. In meeting with the Star's editorial board a few weeks ago, Moore said he wasn't opposed to a privatized system in concept. Uh, this is CQ Weekly, November 98. Moore said he's particularly concerned with preserving and strengthening Social Security, perhaps by allowing some payroll taxes for the program to be invested in financial markets. 
I'm not quite sure what his position is. But let me tell you that simply by putting some things off book, that's just a bookkeeper's trick. That's just shifting the numbers. We have got to have a higher rate of return. Thank you, Congressman Moore. Well, he's never really practiced law, so he doesn't understand how it works, but Kansas lawyers have to have a trust account to segregate their, their, their funds from their clients' funds. If you violate that trust, you can be disbarred. What I want to do is set up a real Social Security trust fund and say to Congress, you can't take money out of that for tax cuts or new spending programs. That will preserve Social Security into the future. He doesn't have a plan on that. I do. Let's talk about the issue of health care. Congressman Moore, the availability of affordable health care has been a campaign plank of yours in the last four elections. Yet since you've been in Congress, the number of uninsured Americans has grown. The anxiety of families over health care has increased. You have served under both a Democrat and Republican president. Why hasn't anything been done? And what can you tell the voters that you will do to make things better if you are sent back to Washington? 90 seconds. I have a bill that would provide health insurance or provide a tax credit to small businesses. Those are uh, businesses with fewer than 30 employees who provide health insurance to their employees. It's a win-win for the employer. It's a win-win for the employee. It takes the squeeze off the employer and the employee. It's the kind of thing I think we should do. Republicans and Democrats should come together on something like this. It makes common sense. I think it's a very appropriate function for Congress to use this kind of tax policy to give incentives to small businesses to do the right thing for their employees. Also, I have a bill called the MEDS Act. The MEDS Act is a proposal to amend the Medicare slash prescription drug bill that was filed or that was uh, passed into law last December. I got a call from Secretary Thompson of Health and Human Services the night before the vote and he said, Congressman, can you be with us on this? And I said, Mr. Secretary, there's good news and bad news about this bill. It's over 600 pages and any major legislation, there's some good things and bad things. I said, the good things are catastrophic coverage, low income coverage and uh, Medicare reimbursement for health care providers, physicians and hospitals. And he says, what's your concern about the bill? I said, my concern is our seniors in this country pay the highest prices in the whole world for pharmaceuticals. The Secretary of Veterans Affairs has had the authority for years to negotiate with pharmaceutical companies for lower prices. You should have the same authority. He said, if I had that, I would use it, and I could bring drug, drug prices down dramatically. We're going to get that next year. Chris Kobach. I have a plan that it consists of four points, but the first and most important point is medical malpractice reform. And Dennis Moore has been the worst in Congress on this issue. He will never vote for anything that puts some restrictions on these runaway lawsuits. You know, the, in medical malpractice cases, the average jury award net was $3.5 million. That's 10 times what it was, sorry, that's three times what it was 10 years ago. Three times what it was 10 years ago. Now, doctors haven't gotten three times more negligent in the last 10 years. What's been happening is that the punitive damages have been driven upward and upward and upward. The Health Act, which was before Congress this year and last year, and Dennis Moore voted against it both times, would have put some reasonable caps in place, caps that are the same as the Kansas caps, $250,000 on punitives, $250,000 on non-economic damages, and still allows the person to cover all of their economic damage, all of the, the cost of making themselves well and the lost income stream. He voted against it. The Congress's Joint Economic Committee, which is a nonpartisan committee, has estimated that 4 million people would have health insurance in America if only the $250,000 cap on punitive damages were in place. 4 million people would be able to afford health care costs because the costs would go down. The other parts of the program, medical savings accounts. We need to inject market forces in health care, allow people to be more cost sensitive as they purchase uh, medical services. That would also drive down costs. Dennis Moore voted against those. Association health plans allow small businesses to pool together their risk across state lines. Dennis Moore voted against those. The fourth thing I would do, and that is allow reimportation of FDA approved prescription drugs from Canada. That's the only one of the four things we need to do that Dennis Moore, Dennis Moore has favored. Your chance to respond for 30 seconds, Congressman. Actually, is correct. I voted for reimportation last year when it came before Congress, and I hope that it passes either that or my Meds Act bill. When you talk about tort reform, we have had tort reform in Kansas for more than a decade. In fact, I'm told by the doctors here and, and by the people here, they're pretty satisfied with what we have here. I think the other states need to get it right. It's a states' rights issue. He's a big one to talk about states' rights, except when it comes to an issue that he wants to tout, and then he sets that aside. I hope and believe that we can get doctors, insurance companies, and lawyers to come together, all the parties to the table, and find some answer to this question. Professor Kobach. Well, let's, let's talk about the last point first. He's opposed to tort reform because it's a state's rights issue? Please. 
Tort malpractice lawsuits are something that cross state lines. It is a matter of interstate commerce. That's why the federal government is often involved and federal courts are often involved in these suits when there is what's called a diversity jurisdiction, where the doctor is on one side of a state line and the patient is on the other. The federal government can make a meaningful difference. The real reason he won't do it is because he's accepted over $100,000 from American Trial Lawyers Association and their members. Now, as far as his HHS negotiating plan, no proof it will work. Thank you. It is now time to introduce a new segment to our debate. We call this, Do the Ads Add Up? Now, many of you have told us you never know what to believe when you see a political commercial. So we thought it would be enlightening to play an ad from each campaign and then ask the candidates to quiz their opponents on the campaign commercial's accuracy. The candidates themselves, you should know, uh, chose the ads they wanted to discuss. Dennis Moore chose this attack ad on him that is paid for by the National Republican Congressional Committee. There's been a history of terrorist attacks, but today Dennis Moore is putting politics ahead of our security. Moore voted against the military securing our borders to prevent terrorists and drug traffickers from entering our country. Moore voted against information sharing within our own intelligence community. And Moore voted to disclose our nation's intelligence budget and make it public. Today, the world is a dangerous place. Too dangerous for Dennis Moore's politics. The National Republican Congressional Committee is responsible for the content of this advertising. Congressman Moore, your response. Well, the ad says that I supported disclosing the intelligence budget. I supported disclosing overall budget categories, but not operational details. In fact, that's the same position the 9-11 Commission, this uh, bipartisan 9-11 Commission endorsed in the report which was handed down on July 22. Uh, I supported the war in Afghanistan. I supported the President's use of force resolutions, as I said before. I'm a member of the 9-11 Commission. I brought together in the Kansas City area about two weeks after the September attack three years ago, the first responders in this area, firefighters, law enforcement officials, public officials, health, uh, health officials, to discuss what we could do to discuss our state of preparedness in the Kansas City metropolitan area for another attack and what we could do to, to protect us the best. Uh, I'm proud of the fact that the PAC, the, P, the, the PAC of the VFW has endorsed me because of my support of our troops in, in Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, I fought hard for our troops since this uh, attack three years ago. My opponent says I opposed information sharing, but he really knows that's not true. What we've got to do is stop playing partisan games here and come together and work together, Republicans and Democrats, for our country. In fact, I wrote a letter to President Bush on August 6 of this year and said, Mr. President, this was about two weeks after the 9-11 Commission handed down the recommendation. I said, Mr. President, we need to remember the way we felt on September 11, three years ago. On that date, we weren't Republicans or Democrats. We came together as Americans. We're all Americans, and we need to do what we can to protect our country and our people. Professor Kobach. Well, he says that in terms of disclosing intelligence budget, he was, uh, voting, he was voting for uh, disclosing categories, not details. My point is, none of it should have been disclosed. Only the overall budget amount uh, that goes to intelligence and nothing more. That information is useful to terrorists who need information on our sources and methods. Did you notice that he missed the central point of the ad? The central point of the ad is that he consistently refuses to deploy the National Guard troops to our border. This is something that's critical. We have taken steps, and I've been part of those steps that we've taken, to tighten up the scrutiny we give to aliens coming in the United States at the ports of entry. The terrorists know this, and they now are attempting, more often, overland entry into the United States. Let me give you a few examples. Uh, on January 15, 2004, Mahmoud Karani, indicted in Dearborn, Michigan, for conspiring to provide material support to Hezbollah. How did he get in? By his own admission, he bribed a Mexican consul official in Beirut to get him to Mexico, and then he went over the southern border. Just in July of this year, uh, Farida Ahmed, a uh, high-level Al-Qaeda operative who had been on CIA and FBI watch list was apprehended in McAllen, Texas, three days after she crossed the Mexican border. We have to be serious about deploying the National Guard. And it's not just the southern border, it's both borders. Now, moreover, let's look at the numbers. The Border Patrol admits by its own, it acknowledges that in the last two years, 1,134 people have been apprehended from state sponsors of terrorism or, or Al-Qaeda-associated nations attempting to sneak in. And they acknowledge that for every one they caught, there were three that they didn't catch. Now, why would people from those countries be going to Canada, Mexico, and then trying to sneak in? We have to get real about securing our nation's homeland, and that means deploying the National Guard. Dennis Moore. Mr. Kobach talks about deploying National Guard troops on the southern border, the northern border. Even President Bush and Secretary Tom Ridge, Secretary of Homeland Defense Tom Ridge, are opposed to his plan. They're absolutely opposed to it. They say we don't need it. It won't work 
and yet he knows better than the President and the Director of Homeland Security, I think Mr. Mr. Kobach is absolutely wrong. He talks about founding a program while he was part of the Attorney General's office called NSEERS. That program has been largely discontinued and discredited, discredited by the administration who wrote a letter around to try to appease our allies. Professor Kobach. Uh, that latest answer shows how utterly ignorant he is of the NCRS program. The letter was written to our allies to explain to them which foreigners would be fingerprinted. Not only did we continue fingerprinting, because that was the part they were nervous about, but Secretary of Homeland Security Tom Ridge expanded the fingerprinting to 23 million people coming in each year. So it wasn't discredited, it was expanded. Indeed, it led to the apprehension of 11 suspected terrorists and more than 1,000 criminals at our border. As far as the President being against it, no, the President did deploy the National Guard to the border. You may not have known this. It, hurt, it happened in 2002 between May and September. It was a stunning success. We need to do it again. Thank you. Well, it's your turn now, Professor Kobach, and you chose uh, this ad you wanted to respond to from the More for Congress campaign. Why are Kansans turning from Chris Kobach? Look who's supporting him. People and groups tied to white supremacists gave Kobach thousands. One even hired Kobach. It's true. An extremist group hired Kobach to file a frivolous lawsuit against the state of Kansas, costing taxpayers thousands. Now Kobach's campaign won't return the contributions, says absolutely we're going to keep it. Chris Kobach, wrong for mainstream Kansans. I'm Dennis Moore, and I approve this message. A desperate man who will say anything to get elected. With his character assassination attempt, he not only hurts my reputation, he hurts my family, and this is something that the third district voters do not deserve, the cheap politics of personal destruction. Mr. Moore, I have three questions for you. First, these people tied to white supremacists that you refer to are John and Mary Lou Tanton, who served on the board of Immigration Reform PAC, which contributed to my campaign. By five degrees of separation, you draw, me, uh, draw a very attenuated link to white supremacists. My question is this. The Tantons also served on the board of Planned Parenthood, Sierra Club, and the League of Conservation Voters, all of which gave you campaign contributions. So by your own tortured logic, aren't you equally linked to white supremacists? Second, the so-called frivolous lawsuit that I brought was to block implementation of Kansas Bill 2145, which gives in-state tuition to illegal aliens. That was a direct violation of a 1996 Act of Congress. You may not know known about it because you weren't in Congress yet, but that act forbids a state from giving in-state tuition to illegal aliens unless the state gives in-state tuition to all U.S. citizens. Please explain how enforcing the unequivocal words of federal law is frivolous. Third, you claim it will cost taxpayers thousands. Uh, Mr. Moore, the state of Kansas has attorneys whose job it is to litigate such suits. At most, it would cost a couple of thousand dollars in man hours. In contrast, the taxpayer subsidy that Governor Sebelius wants to give illegal aliens will cost $8,000 a year per alien at the Kansas University. This year there alone, there are 30 students taking advantage of the subsidy, costing more than $150,000. And if the Kansas City Star is correct in predicting that 2,000 people will take advantage, it will cost more than, one, more than $15 million. Your chance to respond, Congressman Moore. He said there would be more than 2,000 people taking advantage of that law. In fact, there are 30, 30 and not 2,000. This law was passed by the Republican-controlled legislature, signed into law by Governor Sebelius, and supported by the Board of Regents. It's not illegal aliens, it's the children, innocent children of people who are here. And I think it's in our interest to give them an opportunity to succeed. I want to read you what the Kansas City Star said on October 14. This is a letter from the Kansas, or the le a report by the Kansas City Star, Brad Cooper. Kobach, Kobach has received support from several groups like Team America, which says on its website that if the United States opens its borders, quote, our island of productivity and prosperity will soon disappear beneath a flood of third world squalor. And Mr. Kobach signed, got $1,000 from that group, and signed a pledge that says this, I will support a timeout on immigration until serious reforms can be enacted. This means a halt to all immigration. And some of the other folks he's talked to are talking about a 10-year timeout for immigration. Ours is a nation of immigrants. There are people in this country who would have you believe that every immigrant is a terrorist. It's just not the case. Just not the case, Mr. Kobach. Tantons, the Tantons were on the Planned Parenthood 10 years ago and have been gone from those boards 10 years ago. These folks are tied to white supremacist groups, as is your friend Larry Pratt, whom you met with and received money from. Professor Kobach, 30 seconds to he respond. Doesn't, he doesn't explain the whole absurd logic of his charge. Uh, if you keep on drawing the groups that they're associated with, it's to the Pioneer Fund, whose founder in the 1930s held eugenicist views. It's 
10 years ago, try 75 years ago by your own absurd logic, Mr. Moore. And furthermore, this is not the kind of campaign that people want. This is the politics of personal destruction. You talk about uh, that I predicted so many people would come in 2000. No, the Kansas City Star that you're so fond of quoting, they predicted 2000 people would take advantage of the subsidy. The point is, it's not just about innocent children, as you point out. It's about incentives to violate our immigration laws. We have got to start enforcing the rule of law. Final word to you, Congressman Moore. This isn't about personality. It's about judgment. It's about people we choose to take money from and associate with. And when I see Mr. Kobach taking money time and time again, and even the latest report showed he'd received several thousand more dollars from these groups with ties to white supremacists, I wonder, you be the judge. Now, this doesn't seem to be the time now to ask you about the most important thing you've learned about being around strong women, so we'll leave that one <laughs> to the side. Now, over... The last several weeks, the Kansas City Star newspaper and KCPT Public Television has been soliciting your questions for the, for the candidates. We invited those questioners, those pre-selected questioners, to join us in the audience. We're going to hear that first question now. Could you come to the microphone? Tell us your name, sir, and your question. Hi, my name is Mike Stanley, and I live in Olathe. Ninety percent of Americans believe that the Pledge of Allegiance should contain the words, under God. Congressman Moore, you voted against the Pledge of Allegiance Protection Act. Mr. Kobach, how would you have voted? And Congressman Moore, should, in God we trust, be removed from our currency? Thank you for the question. Okay, first of all, when we go to the audience questions, we're going to go to 60 seconds per answer, and it starts with you, Chris Kobach. Uh, I would have voted for the Pledge Protection Act. Uh, Mr. Moore's response, to, or his, his excuse for not voting for the Pledge Protection Act, is that this would destroy the checks and balances in our system. Well, as a constitutional law professor, I can tell you that this is one of the checks and balances that the framers put in the system. In Article 3, it allows Congress to limit the jurisdiction of federal courts in particular cases. That's exactly what the Protection Act did. It would have eliminated the jurisdiction to, uh, to, take, to hear a case that would have removed the words uh, under God from the pledge. Similarly, in God We Trust, of course, it should not be removed from our coins. That reflects the heritage of our country. It is a, an historical statement. It is not a prayer. It is not something that violates the First Amendment. There have been so many courts that have tried to radically expand uh, the, the separation of church and state that is embodied in the First Amendment. Of course, separation of church and state isn't even in the First Amendment. It just prohibits the establishment of a religion. And I've taken those words to try to drive any semblance of religion from the public square. We also have to remember that the Supreme Court itself has a tablet of the Ten Commandments carved into the building. So to, to make the, the case that under God should be removed from the pledge is simply absurd. Congressman Moore, 60 seconds. And the truth and the fact is I voted last year to keep uh, under God in the Pledge of Allegiance. What he's talking about and what you're talking about is a, court, uh, is a law, a, a bill, a law that would strip federal courts of jurisdiction to hear the case, just to hear the case. I don't want to set, up, upset the balance of power in this case. We have a fine balance between the executive, the legislative, and the judicial branches of government. That's the way it's been since our country started. I don't want to change that. I want to keep under God in our, in our uh, Pledge of Allegiance, and I'm fine with in God we trust on our money as well. You don't uh, lose your right to 30 seconds of rebuttal in this round, so it starts with you, Congress, uh, Mr. Uh, Kobach. Uh, the, uh, the point he makes is that he votes for a resolution saying, yeah, wouldn't it be good to keep under God in the pledge? But then when it comes to taking action, he's not willing to do it, just like the Lawrence Journal world says. When it actually comes to the way he talks to voters back home, it sounds like he shares our values. But when it comes to actually doing something, to protect the words under God, something that the framers intended would be used from time to time. In fact, we used it most recently in 1996 in an anti-terrorism law, that we can sometimes remove jurisdiction of federal courts. He's unwilling to do it. I haven't heard a coherent legal description for, from him why we shouldn't do that in this case. Final word to you, Congressman. Well, well, please listen. What I said is we shouldn't change the fine balance we've established in our Constitution since our country was founded by our framers. I know you know what the Constitution says. I just wish you understood what the framers intended when they wrote the Constitution. They wanted to keep a check and balance system between the three branches of government. I told you I voted last year for under God in the Pledge of Allegiance, and I support in God we trust on our money. Let's go back to our audience. Thank you, sir, for coming. Your name and your question, please. I'm Dan Bells. I'm a senior for Sh from Shawnee Mission East, and I'll be a first-time voter this year. And as such, I feel I'm well-informed from the national election but not necessarily for this one. And so how would you distinguish yourselves from the uh, presidential candidates from your respective parties? Congressman Moore, 60 seconds. 
Well, I don't really feel the need to distinguish myself from the, the presidential candidates. I tell you what I tell everybody, and that is I try to look at issues on an issue-by-issue -issue basis. If the president's right, whether it's a President Kerry or a President Bush, I'm going to vote with the president. If he's wrong, I'll respectfully say to whomever it is, Mr. President, I think there's a better way to do it, and tell him or her what I think that better way is. And I think we need to do that. We need less partisanship, and we need more people who are willing to work together across party lines, Republicans and Democrats, in the center of the political spectrum, because that's where things happen, and get things done for the American people. 80% of the things we do in Congress uh, on bills shouldn't be partisan at all. And there are some people who try to pull everybody apart. I think 80% of the people in Congress are good, decent, honorable people, Republicans and Democrats, who want to do the right thing. We need to keep those people there and others out. Professor Kobach. Funny, I didn't hear him answer the question. Uh, I can distinguish myself from the presidential candidate in two ways. Uh, first of all, uh, the president has shown some support for an amnesty proposal, uh, which was in December of 2003 when it was proposed. I'm against that. Past amnesties have only led to increased illegal immigration and indeed have led to the legalization of terrorists. Uh, secondly, I can distinguish myself in that I would be uh, more restrictive fiscally. I want to see our federal deficit cut, and I'm not happy with the growth in federal spending, more than 30% growth in the last four years. I've answered the question. The reason he, he won't distinguish himself is because he can't distinguish himself from John Kerry. Indeed, the uh, liberal group Americans for Democratic Action has given Dennis Moore the Liberal Hero Award, and this year Dennis Moore's voting is at a 90% on their 100 scale. Uh, he's actually beating John Kerry, who only gets an 85 this year. So it's very difficult for him to distinguish himself from John Kerry because he can only distinguish himself by being more liberal. Dennis Moore, 30 seconds to respond. Um, he can call names all he wants. It's just not the truth. And in fact, I think uh, I voted three years ago for the president's first tax cut. We were in surplus mode at that time. He talks about trying to eliminate the deficits and the debt. The way he's going, folks, it's never, never going to happen. I voted for the president's first tax cut three years ago. We were in surplus mode. I voted against it last year because we were in heavy deficit mode. In fact, I supported an alternative to the president's proposal that was half the cost of the president's but was fully paid for so it didn't contribute to more debt. That's what I'm talking about. We need people with some common sense, not just intelligent people, but common sense. Last word goes to you, Chris Kobach. Well, once again, you see him trying to obfuscate. He takes one pro-taxpayer vote, and that's not enough to get him out of the F grade from the National Taxpayer Union. But let me tell you just a few of the other votes when he's voted against tax cuts. Uh, May 2001, uh, April 2002, um, August 1999, uh, the death tax again and again and again. He does not want to see the elimination of the death tax, and he has never changed his opinion there. Clearly, he is against cutting, tax pay cutting taxes, and that makes him an enemy of the taxpayer. Thank you. Back to the audience we go, and your question, please, sir. My name is Brendan Franz, and I live in Overland Park, and I will be voting this election. And having studied sociology, uh, I've realized the importance of immigrant workers to the U.S. economy. I just want to know what plan both of you support um, about the immigrant workers. Professor Kobach, 60 seconds. Good question. Um, there are several things we need to do. But we have to have a reasonable, realistic way to address the illegal immigration problem in America. There are 8 million, more than 8 million illegal immigrants in the country right now. What we have to do is not give a slap in the face to those people. There are more than 6 million waiting outside our country for, for, to come in legally, lawfully. It's a slap in the face to give an amnesty to people already here. Dennis Moore has voted for amnesties twice. What we need to do is streamline the legal process so that the people who, who are trying to follow the law don't have to wait two years to be reunited with a spouse or don't have to wait a year and a half to get a work visa, but that we, we tighten the, the time so that they can get that visa within, within uh, 30 days or 60 days. That will increase the incentives to come in legally. Then we have to get serious about enforcing the law against those who come in illegally. It's absolutely critical that we would return the rule of law to immigration. I testified before the House Immigration Subcommittee and the Senate Immigration Subcommittee as an expert witness on the CLEAR Act, which would have done that. Would have given incentives for cooperation between state and local law enforcement and federal law enforcement to actually get the job done. Dennis Moore. You know, it's funny he says that because the chairman of the uh, Judiciary Committee, a Republican, named Jim Sensenbrenner has said, the vote that I cast was not for amnesty. In fact, 92 Republicans, including the chairman, Republican chairman, voted with me on that. It is not against amnesty. He keeps saying that. He's telling half the truth, half the truth. In fact, Mr. Sensenbrenner said the people who value families would vote with us on this vote. I voted with the chairman there because he was absolutely right there. 
I want smart borders, not sealed borders. And you heard what Mr. Coopers in the Kansas City Star said. What he wants is to keep people out who will disappear beneath a flood of third world squalor. Our prosperity will. That is absolutely not right. I want smart borders, not sealed borders. And he signed a pledge to enforce sealed borders in the future until immigration laws are reformed. I want immigration laws reformed. I was a district attorney, I believe, in enforcing laws. But we've got to reform those laws. President Bush has talked about that. And next year, if the president's there, I'll work with him. 30 seconds rebuttal, Chris Kobach. Uh, he is utterly lying here. He voted for an amnesty, several forms, not only the bill that he's sponsoring, which gives amnesty to certain students who qualify, but also the 245I amnesty, which Mr. Sensenbrenner was not co uh, commenting on. That was in March of 2002. He voted for that amnesty. Look it up. Go to the Thompson website at the Library of Congress. Um, as far as sealing the borders, that, that statement that I signed is exactly correct as a strategic uh, lever in negotiating. There's so many people in Congress who don't want to touch immigration. They won't reform it. Well, I think we have to uh, hold the lever, the, the potential threat of sealing the border, to get real reforms. And Congressman Moore. Uh, you check yourself and see this last vote that Chairman Sensenbrenner talked about. The quote that I gave you is correct. He is either not informed or he's not telling you the truth. And I'd, like to, I'd prefer to believe he's not informed, but I'm not sure about that anymore. We go back to the audience now, and another question. Good evening. I'm Mary Kay Rawson from Shawnee, Kansas. Mr. Kobach, you've taken a stand opposing embryonic stem cell research under any circumstances, knowing that many of the embryos that are now frozen will be destroyed. Why not let those embryos be used for research? One could use the analogy that it is like when a person is pronounced brain dead, and the family is asked to let that person become an organ donor to let some good come out of a bad situation. Congressman Moore will get that question first. I think the potential for scientific discoveries and research that's going to lead to cures for horrible diseases that afflict people in this country and around the world could come from stem cell research. I understand the religious sensitivities involved, and I want to respect those. And I found out a long time ago that best policies are not necessarily in either extreme, but somewhere closer to the center. And I think we can work together, people of good faith, work together in the center of the spectrum and try to find ways to address that. Nancy Reagan would like to see embryonic stem cell research. Christopher Reeves and his family would like to see embryonic stem cell research. My father suffers from Alzheimer's and I would like to see stem, stem cell embryonic research as well. Again, we can respect the concerns that people have and still do this thing which will help cure juvenile diabetes, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, spinal cord injuries possibly and other diseases. Chris Kobach. Well, if I were, uh, if I were believing that line, I would, uh, being a, a juvenile diabetic myself and taking insulin uh, since the age of 11, that's 27 years, uh, I suppose I would vote for anything that might potentially, if someone told me there was some prospect of, of medical research, I would vote for that. But then you look a little deeper at the facts and you see that embryonic stem cell research has not yielded one successful therapeutic experience. The other types of stem cell research, which I do support, have actually been successful. Adult stem cell research, which does not have any problems with tissue rejection, and umbilical cord stem cell research. Also, a, a successful area of stem cell research. We should move full speed ahead there. But remember, we're only talking about federal funding, by the way, too. We shouldn't be funding the destruction of human beings in order for their pieces to be harvested for the benefit of others. Now, the question was about in vitro fertilization clinics. I don't think Mr. Moore answered that. My point there is that the in vitro fertilization clinics, the numbers of, of embryos in those clinics are not enough to even move one therapeutic use forward uh, in, in embry uh, embryonic stem cells. So that in terms of actually making that work as a you know, source of harvesting these cells, there's not enough there. 30 seconds to rebut. He's wrong. He's wrong. Check the facts, Mr. Kobach. And the fact is, if we were able to use some of those cells from uh, fertilization clinics, it could provide the, the additional cell lines that scientists need to do this research. Right now, there are between 17 and 25 cell lines being used, and these are contaminated. That's why I think they're not going to be successful in the future. Final word to you, Chris Kobach. Well, I, I guess he can say the words, he's wrong, he's wrong. <laughs> Show me one study. There, there are no studies that have yielded any therapeutic success uh, with embryonic stem cells. We have to be realistic here. We have to be ethical. We've always had boards of ethics that address these, these kind of cutting-edge sciences. And you're talking about harvesting, terminating a human life, and then harvesting 
that human life for the benefit of others. I think there's something ethic ethically pro problematic there. And if we've got advances in the other areas, advances in adult stem cells and umbilical cord stem cells, let's push full speed ahead there, where we've seen success and there are not the ethical okay. problems. Well, that concludes the question and answer portion of this debate. In just a moment, we'll invite Dennis Moore and Chris Kobach to deliver their closing statements. But first, we wanted to know, well, when you go into the voting booth on November 2nd and work your way down the ballot to the Kansas 3rd uh, District race, you'll see two other names there. They are the names of the Libertarian and Reform Party candidates running in this race. This week, we invited both of them to record a 90-second statement that talks about why they're running and the issues that define their candidacy. Dick Wells is the candidate for the Reform Party. My name is Dick Wells, and I'm the Reform Party candidate. Congressman Dennis Moore originally ran as an independent Democrat, but his voting record shows him to be a party-line liberal Democrat, not like the majority of his Kansas constituents. To ensure there was a voice in the campaign for issues important to me, and I believe to the majority of the people of the 3rd District, I entered the congressional race as the Reform Party candidate. Those important issues are, first, preservation of marriage. Activist judges will undoubtedly impose same-sex marriage on America unless we have a constitutional amendment, something Dennis Moore opposes. Second, pro-life policies. Preserving the lives of the most helpless in our society is very important to me. Representative Moore has the opposite view and is pro-abortion. And finally, <clears throat> smaller government and lower taxes. President Ronald Reagan said that government is not the solution. Government is the problem. But Dennis Moore votes for big government and high taxes. However, when Chris Kobach won the Republican primary, the race had a major party candidate whose positions on these vital issues are very close to mine. It only makes sense for me to support Chris Kobach's campaign. Therefore, I wish to take this opportunity to publicly endorse Chris Kobach for Congress. Thank you. Joe Bellis of the Libertarian Party declined to record a candidate statement, and now we invite our Republican and Democratic Party candidates here in the theater to make their closing statements as dictated by the luck of the coin toss. The first statement goes to Chris Kobach. Well, I'm pleased to accept the endorsement of the Reform Party. What a surprise. <laughs> I, I think it's utterly clear to everyone here that Mr. Moore's votes are so far out of the mainstream, he can't even see the water from where he stands. And that's why the Americans for Democratic Action gave him the Liberal Hero Award. That's why the National Federation of Independent Businesses gives him a zero score, tied with Ted Kennedy. But there is another reason why you should not vote to return Mr. Moore to Washington. He has been utterly ineffective in Congress. In six years, he has only sponsored and introduced two bills that actually passed. Now don't be confused by his crowing about being a co-sponsor or about jumping on a bandwagon because in many bills there are more than 50 co-sponsors. No, he's only been the originator of two bills that passed. And what did they do? Both bills renamed post offices. Congratulations, Mr. Moore. We are all very thankful. But we have had a do-nothing congressman now for six years and it's time for a change. The people of Kansas deserve better. Dennis Moore, the final word to you. This is the same man who posted an Adam Taff alert for liberal alert. This is the man from where he stands, everybody is a liberal. Everybody is a liberal. When he says that I've only had two bills and they were post offices, that absolutely is not true. Either your computer's not working or you just don't know where to look. You should find out the facts though, Mr. Mr. Kobach. My thanks to Nick Haynes and all the folks here for sponsoring this debate. Two years ago in endorsing my candidacy, the Kansas City Star said this, Quote, we continue to be impressed with his performance. He cuts through the partisan rhetoric in search of logical, common sense solutions, end quote. To me, that's what's being a, an effective congressman all about. I ask for your support again this year to return me to Congress, to continue to work on issues on an issue-by-issue -issue basis. Again, when the Republicans are right, I'll vote with the Republicans. When the Democrats are by, right, I'll vote with the Democrats. I also keep my five grandchildren in mind when I cast important issues affecting our nation, our country. I want their future and the future of your kids and grandkids to be safe and secure and full of opportunities. That's my pledge as a congressman, and I ask for your vote on November 2nd. Democrat Dennis Moore and Republican Chris Kobach, thank you so much for being with us. From all of us here at Johnson County Community College and our sponsors, I'm Nick Haynes of KCPT Public Television. Good night.
Bush presidency, Monday and Tuesday at